Hello class, welcome. I'm Dr. Mo, and today we are going to be exploring a truly fascinating topic, neuroparasites. But um, in order to discuss this topic, we have to first revisit the idea of symbiosis. In the second lecture that I gave on hydrothermal vents, we discussed the idea of obligate mutualism uh, this is a, a type of symbiosis. Um, symbiosis is a biological interaction where two or more organisms that are different species are living together sort of long term. Uh, if you'll recall, obligate mutualism is a symbiotic relationship where one or more of the organisms cannot function independently in an environment. And their symbiotic relationship is generally a positive condition for both organisms. Uh, today, we will be discussing another type of symbiosis, parasitic symbiosis, that is. And in this type of interaction, one of the organism lives inside or on the surface of another organism. And the organism that is being lived upon is usually referred to as the host although it's kind of hard to imagine that the other organism is much of a guest. That's because in a parasitic relationship, the host is harmed in some way and the parasite benefits. We tend to think of parasites as insects. Some of those you might know, like fleas, for example, or in some cases, things like worms, like the hookworm, or in some cases, single-celled organisms, and many times they're so small that we often just think of the parasite as basically just a disease. But parasitic organisms can actually be found in all of the kingdoms of organisms, including things like plants and birds and mammals and even fungi. To be a parasite, what you need to do is to exploit your host for resources that are necessary for your survival. And for some organisms, this is done directly by, say, sucking their blood. Oh, yeah. Uh, Edward? You know, that guy from Twilight? I mean, he may sparkle in the sunlight, but... He is a parasite, and to be honest, I'm not sure how someone chooses the life of a parasite over the life of a shapeshifter. So, uh, I guess hashtag Team Jacob? Okay, well, uh, in any case, blood sucking isn't the only interaction that parasites have with their hosts. Some parasites simply steal food from their hosts, but some of them can kill them completely. Most of the parasites that suck blood from their hosts fall into a common strategy of parasites, and they're grouped together, and they're usually referred to as microparasites or micropredators. And micropredators, they attack sort of a wide variety of hosts that they interact with, and in most cases, very briefly with each one. So I'm sure you can think of an example of this. For most people, we're familiar with the idea of a mosquito, and mosquitoes are a type of micropredator. The thing that's interesting about most micropredators is that because they interact with so many hosts, and um, they usually only reduce, reduce the host's fitness just a little bit, they actually function pretty well as vectors. And in this case, when I say vector, I mean an organism that can transfer small parasites from one host to another. Okay, well, micropredators are just one of six major common strategies that are basically used by all parasites that we know of. And for the rest of today's lecture, uh, I will be dedicating the, um, the rest of it towards sort of discussing the remaining five parasitic strategies. But 
I will apply all of them to a specific subgroup of parasites called neuroparasites. Neuroparasitology is a relatively new field of biology, and it explores parasites that alter the behavior of their host. An important aspect of this type of parasitism is that the altered behavior of the host increases the likelihood of success for the parasite only. This can include behavior that expands the transmission of the parasite, or it may redirect the host to move to some location in the environment that it would not normally occupy, or it may just increase the parasite's chance of survival. But generally speaking, neuroparasites can elicit three broad categories of behaviors in their host. Their mind control, as you might think of it, is sort of limited to three basic types of responses. One of these is suicidal behavior. In other words, they inhabit the host and then cause it to kill itself. Another one of these behaviors is called bodyguarding. And in bodyguarding behaviors, what happens is the host, for some reason, under the mind control of the parasite, actually tries to protect the parasite itself, oftentimes at their own expense. Um, one other aspect that usually happens, and in some ways it's the freakiest, it's the spontaneous movement behaviors. Some of the parasites basically find ways to literally control the movements of their host. Okay, so let's talk about these five other major strategies that are utilized by all parasites. And um, the first of these categories is what we call parasitic castrators. And, um, well, it's basically just as bad as it sounds, I'm afraid. These are parasites that destroy their host's ability to reproduce, and then the parasite uses the energy that the host would normally have spent on reproduction towards their own growth and success. A perfect example of this type of parasitism um, in nature is the narrow parasitic barnacle called Saculina. The Saculina barnacles will find a crab like this poor specimen, and it will crawl around on the outer carapace of the crab until it finds a joint that it can enter through. And at that point, the barnacle will actually shed its own hard skeleton and insert itself entirely into the crab. Eventually, the barnacle will develop and it will grow a sac-like structure, highlighted here in this picture, that juts through the carapace of the crab and renders it infertile. And this sac structure of the barnacle physically replaces the crab's reproductive structures on their bodies. And well, from this point forward, all energy that normally would have gone towards reproduction by the crab is siphoned off by the barnacle parasite. In fact, the barnacle steals so much of the crab's energy that going forward, the crab can never actually molt again. It's stuck at this size forever. And in male crabs, the damage is particularly gruesome. Uh, crabs that are infected by this parasitic, parasitic barnacle that are male are also chemically castrated by the parasite. Uh, the chemicals from the barnacle force the male crab host to begin to resemble a female crab and chemically and physically change its body. The castration even goes so far as to make the male crabs perform female crab mating dances and it tricks them into thinking that they can actually lay eggs. Parasitized crabs, although castrated at this point, will still attempt to lay eggs. But instead of laying their own eggs, 
they will lay the eggs of the Saculina barnacle instead. And then the crab host, after it lays the eggs, will continue to guard the eggs of the barnacle and treat them as their own offspring until the larvae of the barnacle hatch and then seek out their own crabs as hosts. Parasitic barnacle is not just a parasitic castrator, it's also what we call a neuroparasite. In other words, it not only infects the body, but it also appears to, for lack of a better word, control the mind of its host. And in this way, it causes the crab to do things it would not normally do, and they only benefit the parasite. In our list of altered behaviors that I gave you before, this parasite mostly invokes both spontaneous movement and bodyguarding behaviors from its host. Okay, so that one's particularly gruesome, but in the next class of parasitic strategies that we will discuss, these are the directly transmitted parasites. We will see much more. Uh, this directly transmitted parasites, it, it describes any type of parasite that infects the host directly without using any sort of organism acting between it and the host as some sort of a vector. And some viruses, like the baculoviruses, are a type of parasite and it infects caterpillars of moths and of butterflies. Once infected, the caterpillar will continue on as usual, munching away on plants, but the food that it's consuming is instead used by this virus as fuel. And it will use this fuel to continue to colonize the caterpillar's body. And Eventually, when the virus colony has grown large enough and it's ready to spread to a new host, it begins to alter the caterpillar's behavior. What happens is the caterpillar begins to eat continuously, without resting, day and night chomping on plants, and eventually what happens is the caterpillar will start to climb and it will climb up plants that it normally consumes, and it will continue to climb to the top of the plant, often even leaving itself exposed to predators as it goes. And once the caterpillar reaches the top, well, the virus activates an enzyme, and it causes the caterpillar to self-destruct. The caterpillar dissolves itself into a blob of goo, and this goo rains down from the plant above to the plant below, where it can be ingested by new caterpillars in order to infect them and repeat the cycle. The behavior that causes the caterpillar to climb the plant, in this case, makes it more likely that when it liquefies itself, it will spread to new caterpillar hosts. And in our list of different behaviors, this one definitely qualifies as suicidal behavior and, well, I guess probably some spontaneous movement. One of the most famous neurocyte, neuroparasites is the so-called zombie ant fungus, and it is a directly transmitted parasite. Ants that are foraging for food on the forest floor can be infected by the spore of this fungus. Once infected, the ant will continue to live, more or less as usual, for about a week, while the fungus that has infected it continues to, de to develop inside its body. The spores of this fungus 
produce filaments called mycelia, which grow throughout the body of the ant internally, feeding on the host's organs. However, these mycelia always manage to avoid the vital organs of the ant. As the infecting fungus matures, it starts to alter the behavior of the ant, turning it more and more into a zombie-like organism. It will exert controls that lead the ant away from its colony, and the zombified ant will always wander off until they find some sort of a tree or a plant, and then it will start climbing it until the ant reaches an elevation with the right amount of humidity for the fungus to grow. And then the ant is instructed by the fungus somehow to clamp onto a leaf with its mandibles. And well, this is not a behavior that is normal for these types of ants. At this point, the fungus is ready to, pro to produce spores, so it will feed on the ant's brains, leaving it permanently attached to the leaf, and within a day, the fruiting body of the fungus bursts out of the ant's corpse, and the fruiting body, seen here, releases a bunch of capsule-like structures that are filled with more spores, and once these capsules are airborne, they explode in midair and they rain down fungal spores on the forest floor where the cycle begins anew, infecting more ants. In this case, I think most of the behavior altering is spontaneous movement. The ants are not only the only insects to become zombified by behavior-altering parasites. In fact, spiders can actually be subjected to zombifying wasps. In Costa Rica, there is an orb-weaving spider that can be parasitized by a wasp, and it glues its eggs to the outside of the spider's body. When the larva hatches, it digs into the abdomen of the spider and it begins sucking its blood and also somehow controls its mind. And in the span of a couple of weeks, the larva grows to full size and it begins altering the spider's behavior to benefit the wasp. As the spider nears death from all the blood sucking that's going on from the larva, it starts to tear down its normal web structure, and it begins to build a new one with a very strange design. Rather than a large networked web designed to capture flies and other insects, the new design consists of thickened cable-like threads, and all of the threads meet at a central point in the web, and eventually, when the spider dies, the larva spins a cocoon, a cocoon hanging from the central point in the spider's new web, where no predators can reach it until it emerges from the pupa stage as a full adult wasp. What's really interesting about this case is that the wasp larva does not ever actually inhabit the body of the spider. All of the interactions are from injecting the spider with some sort of psychotropic chemicals that alter the decision-making behavior of the spider. Another interesting example occurs in ladybugs. These cute red and black hard-shelled insects usually are chowing down on aphids to protect your flowers. And well, they have a lot of natural defenses. Aside from just their hard shell, which keeps them protected from ants that are defending the colony of aphids, 
The ladybugs can also leak toxins from their leg joints. And, well, they're pretty unsavory treats for most larger organisms. In nature, when you are brightly colored, like the red and black ladybug, instead of trying to hide yourself from predators, you are sending them a signal. Eating you is a very bad idea. In biology, we call this aposematism. And as a prefix, apo means away, and somatic means to warn. In other words, we are trying to warn organisms away. And, well, it's a behavior that's usually beneficial to both the potential predator and the prey itself. The bright red color of the ladybug is a message that most predators receive. I am not worth eating. Except for one little wasp, Dinocampus ocinelli, which has found a way to exploit the ladybug, ladybug's defenses for itself. This wasp will inject its egg on the underside of the ladybug, along with some chemicals. And, well, for about a week, the ladybug will continue its normal behavior. But when the larva hatches, it will begin to eat the ladybug from the inside out. And over the course of about three weeks, the larva will continue to grow. And when eventually it's ready to emerge from the ladybug, it will paralyze it. And then crawl out of the body and form a cocoon under the legs of the ladybug. Now, I should note that at this point, our ladybug host is still alive, but it is under the control of the larva. While inside the cocoon, the ladybug's natural defenses, the bright color, the hard shell, the toxins in its legs, will all protect the wasp while it's in this vulnerable pupa stage. But it goes even further. If any predators attempt to eat the pupa from the cocoon, the ladybug will retaliate, it will wriggle around, and it will defend the pupa. And in this way, the wasp will eventually emerge from the cocoon as an adult, guarded the whole time by our zombified ladybug. Interestingly, this may not be the end for the ladybug. As a testament to just how tough ladybugs are, about 25% of the zombified ladybugs will actually recover from the paralysis and manage to go on living and somehow no longer a zombie. But there is even more to this bizarre story. The wasp that stings the ladybug? This one? It turns out that it also hosts a parasite. Along with those chemicals that the wasp was injecting into the ladybug, there's actually a virus. A virus that uses the wasp's ovaries as a place to replicate. And there is at least some evidence to suggest that this virus, which the wasp inserts into the ladybug, may actually be the part that's immobilizing the ladybug. And the success of the wasp, which is the host for the virus, is actually the success of the virus itself, providing it with additional new wasp hosts. In science, we have a special name for a parasite like this virus, whose host, the wasp, is also a parasite. These are called hyperparasites. 
And it leaves us with a question. Which one of these parasites is the one controlling the behavior of the ladybug here? Is it the wasp? Or is it the virus? This also brings us to our next group, vector-transmitted parasites. Because if the virus is a parasite that is zombifying our ladybug, then perhaps the wasp is simply a vector. Vector-transmitted parasites usually ride along with microparasites. In biology, the microparasite in this situation is what we call an intermediate host. In other words, they can temporarily reside in this host, but they are not the ultimate destination for the parasite. Most of the vector-transmitted parasites are very small things, like protozoa or bacteria or viruses. In many cases, we may think of the vector-transmitted parasites more like a disease than an actual parasite. Okay, so by this point, you may have begun to wonder if there is any way that some of these behavior-altering neuroparasites could ever control a human host. Would it surprise you to know they already do? In fact, there are a number of studies that showcase how the virus rabies is actually a parasite. Rabies is a good example of a vector-transmitted parasite that is capable of passing between animals and humans through scratches or bites. How does it actually alter the host behavior? Well, Infections of the rabies virus make the host more aggressive. And in other words, they're more likely to scratch or, or bite, acting as a vector, turning every potential host into a potential vector. Are there any others? Indeed, there are. This is the flu. Yes, the common flu, or influenza. And it alters the behavior of its host, which is usually a human. How? It turns out that one study found that people who are infected with the flu become more social. Specifically, in the first 48 hours after being infected, human hosts were more likely to interact with more people and larger groups. And it is during this exact 48-hour period that influenza is most contagious. So, do you feel like heading out to that party? Or is that just a parasite that wants you to think that you are? Okay. One last vector-transmitted parasite before we move on, and it's, again, one you've probably heard of as a disease before, but which is actually a parasite. Malaria. Malaria is caused by the parasitic protozoan plasmodium, which is transmitted by an intermediary host, mosquitoes. You'll recall mosquitoes are a type of micropredator. And it delivers the protozoan into their ultimate target, humans. So do these protozoans actually alter the behavior of humans? In fact, they do not. Okay, so why are we talking about it as a neuroparasite then? because it actually alters the behavior, in this case, of the intermediary host. The mosquito. When plasmodium first infects the mosquito, 
it isn't developed into a parasite that is capable of infecting a human host yet. And this means that in the early stages, when the mosquito is infected, but the protozoan is not prepared to move on to the next host, if the mosquito happens to die, then the protozoan also dies. So it alters the behavior of the mosquito itself, making it less likely to seek out targets and tricking it into giving up on potential prey more quickly. In other words, it avoids putting itself in a position where both the mosquito and the parasitic protozoan may be destroyed. That is, until the protozoan is fully developed and ready to move on to the next stage of life. At which point, it reverses its control over the mosquito. And once the protozoan is matured, the mosquito becomes increasingly reckless and bloodthirsty. It will seek out more and more humans every night. And it will even repeatedly bite the same human. And it will even continue to try to feed on human prey when it's completely full. Its behavior is now altered to make the mosquito more likely to distribute the protozoan to new hosts. And, well, if the mosquito dies, the protozoan doesn't care. It's probably already successfully infected its next host. And the mosquito just becomes expendable. Our next parasitic strategy is a big one in neuroparasites. It is trophically transmitted parasites. And in a previous lecture, we talked about the root word before, trophic. Trophic just means eating. And in this case, we are talking about parasites that are transmitted by being eaten. Usually, trophically transmitted parasites have complex life cycles, and sometimes the parasite will move through more than one intermediate host in different parts of its life stages. Like the plasmodium protozoan that infects the mosquitoes, many trophically transmitted parasites will even modify the behavior of their intermediate hosts in order to reach their ultimate destination host. Our first example of this involves a type of parasitic flatworm called flukes. Flukes are actually masters of behavior altering parasitism, as we shall see. Most flukes live within the bodies of two or more hosts across different stages in their lives. Their most common route for infecting a host is by being eaten by some type of intermediary host. In our first example, we'll explore a fluke that grows from eggs in the droppings of shoreline birds. And like the story of most flukes, somewhere in their life stage, there is a hapless snail. In this case, the snail consumes the droppings of the bird, which also contains the eggs of the fluke, and then it becomes infected by the flukes. In their earliest stages, the fluke will make its intermediate host, which is the horn snail, sterile. And the fluke will live in the body of the snail for a few generations and eventually develop into a larval life stage that has a tail-like appendage that it uses to swim. And eventually the fluke will leave the host and swim out into deeper water, where it will find and attach itself to the gills of a killifish. Killifish tend to live in brackish water and they usually stay away from the surface where birds and other predators can't reach them very easily. 
Usually they have some sort of camouflage where their bellies are a light color and their backs are a darker color so that they're very hard to see. Predators that are above them, well, they would blend into the dark bottom of the water. And for predators that are below them, their light colored bellies would blend into the bright sunlit water that would be above the predator. But in the case where the killifish has been infected by the fluke, the fluke will work its way from the gills to the brain of the fish, where the flukes will form a blanket-like structure over the brain and begin altering the fish's behavior. Fluke-infected killifish are more likely to go towards the surface, and in some cases, they will even flip themselves over, exposing their bright bellies to aerial predators, and this makes them more likely to be consumed by shoreline birds. When these birds, like this gull for example, consume the killifish, the eggs of the fluke are laid in the guts of the shoreline bird, which it then deposits along the shore in their feces to complete the cycle. This pattern of being eaten by an intermediary host is also a strategy employed by the horsehair worm. It's sometimes referred to as the kamikaze horsehair worm. This parasitic worm story starts when it is eaten by an aquatic organism, usually the juvenile form of an aquatic insect, such as a mayfly or a mosquito. In this case, the parasite just rides along with the larval insect until it reaches adulthood, where it uses the insect as its ticket out of the water. And eventually, when this mayfly becomes an adult and starts flying around, it may end up in the unwitting jaws of a cricket or a grasshopper. So, like the fluke worm, it is transmitted by being eaten. And then eaten again as the intermediate host is consumed. And through this, it gets to its ultimate destination, which is something like a cricket or a grasshopper. Once inside the body of the cricket or the grasshopper, the parasite continues to develop, growing incredibly long, like some sort of what long spaghetti noodle. Ugh. But you will recall that our horsehair worm started out in the water and our grasshopper is on the land. And that means for our cycle to be complete, the worm can't emerge at the land. It needs to be back up in the water. And in this case, the horsehair worm does this by altering the cricket or the grasshopper's behavior. In other words, it controls the mind of its host. What it does is basically lead it to head towards lit sources of any sort of surface that has a lot of light on it. And, well, this often includes reflected light that's bouncing off of the water. Ultimately, what happens is the horsehair worm's host will jump like a kamikaze, carrying it as well into the water, where it then vacates its host. However, since crickets and grasshoppers typically cannot swim, in this case, the host most commonly drowns, which is how it earns the name, the kamikaze horsehair worm. All right, I have one final example of a trophically transmitted neuroparasite and, well, it's a bit of a doozy. It's the lancet 
liver fluke. That's right, we're back to talking about flukes. The lancet liver fluke gets its name from the fact that it spends its entire adult life inside the liver of its host. And for most lancet liver flukes, the target host is a cow or some other form of ruminant. Although they have been known to infect other organisms, in, including humans. Okay, so after mating, the adult lay, lays eggs that are ultimately excreted in the feces of the host organism. And let's say, in this case, it's a cow. For the lancet liver flukes, their first intermediary host is, of course, a snail. snail consumes the feces of the cow, and this leads them to also consume the eggs, which hatch into larvae within the bodies of the snails. These larvae move into the digestive tract of the snail, and it defends itself from the fluke worm by walling off the parasites into a type of a cyst that it then excretes onto grasses and other substrates that it crawls across. And this leads the fluke to its second intermediary host, which also consumes it and becomes infected. And that is ants. You probably didn't know this, but ants use snail slime as a source of moisture. And when they come upon the parasite infected cysts, they just consume them and they end up infecting themselves with hundreds of tiny juvenile flukes. And while most of the lancet liver flukes will move into the body of the ant, one will take the initiative and move into the ganglion, which is a brain-like nerve bundle. And this fluke will assume command of the ant's actions. During the day, the ant behaves normally, but when night comes, the ant turns into a zombie, and the liver lancet fluke causes the ant to leave its colony and climb out onto a blade of grass, where it clamps onto the grass and, well, just remains there all night. attached, hanging on. Like those zombie ants that we talked about before that were controlled by a fungus, this is not normal behavior for uninfected ants. And in this case, rather than exploding out of the ant, the lancet liver fluke is attempting for the ant to also be eaten. Hopefully by accident, by some type of ruminant, such as a cow, that is seeking to actually eat the grass. Okay, what's truly bizarre about the lancet liver fluke's mind control is, at dawn, if our ant has not been eaten, the fluke actually relinquishes control, and the ant will return to its colony, and it will continue to behave normally until the next night, where the fluke will take control again, and it will force the ant to abandon the colony and clamp onto another blade of grass. And it will continue this pattern indefinitely, each night turning our hapless ant into a zombie that latches on to a blade of grass, waiting for it to ultimately be eaten so that it can complete its life cycle and live out its adult stage in the liver of a cow. Our last strategy that we will discuss in today's lecture are parasitoids. A parasitoid always kills its host sooner or later, and in this sense, they don't always function like most other parasites. An example of a neuroparasite parasitoid is the zombie fly called 
Apocephalus borealis. These flies are common in North America, and they typically attack paper wasps and bumblebees, but more recently they have become, begun targeting European honeybees as well. The life cycle of the zombie fly starts out as eggs laid into the abdomen of a bee or a wasp. And when the eggs hatch, the larvae feed on the, um, the host's flight muscles. And then as they actually mature into flies, they will emerge from the host, typically between the head and the thorax. If you were paying attention earlier when I was talking about aposematism, you'll recall that the prefix apo means off or away. And, well, cephalus means head. And this whole genus of parasitic flies, aposephalus, are actually well known for decapitating their hosts. In the case of the zombie fly, however, the end result is rarely decapitated bees. But the bees do behave differently when they are infected. They tend to be attracted to light for some reason, and they will leave their hives at night, and they will appear disoriented, and they'll be wandering around in circles together. And it isn't exactly clear yet why the bee's behavior is altered in this way. Although, it has also been suggested that maybe the bees are just trying to remove themselves from the rest of their colony to avoid um, spreading the parasite among them. And I, it's not clear. So um, perhaps the zombie flies are maybe controlling the bees chemically. It's hard to say. Here is a photograph of a honeybee and its parasite that was sent in for today's lecture by one of your fellow classmates. It was captured flying into their home late at night, but the bee's strange behavior led them to acquire a nickname. These bees are called zombies, and it's the subject of a citizen science project called Zombie Watch. If you would like to contribute as a citizen scientist by reporting any strangely behaving zombies that you observe, I have provided a link for this project in the comments section below. Okay, another classic example of a neuroparasitic parasitoid is the jewel wasp, Ampulex compressa. This one. The prey of this wasp is a cockroach, which the wasp turns into a zombie by stinging. Once stung, the zombified cockroach will become mostly paralyzed and passive, and it will just stand around, basically unable to defend itself. But rather than consume the cockroach, this clever little wasp grabs the cockroach by an antenna and leads it back to its nest as if it were a dog on a leash. Once back in the wasp burrow, the wasp lays an egg on the underbelly of the cockroach's abdomen. And while the cockroach is perfectly capable of moving, it just stands there, passively, in the burrow, until the wasp's egg hatches, and the larva bores into the cockroach and eats it. The parasitic jewel wasp sting is loaded with chemicals that appear to work like a psychoactive drug, and the sting itself is sort of surgical in nature, driven by the wasp directly into the part of the cockroach's brain that affects its movement. And while the cockroach is tripping, it basically has no motivation to escape. 
because of the drugs in its system. Okay, so that is our lecture for today on neuroparasites. If you have any questions that you have been saving up, now is your chance to ask them. I hope they found this lecture to be as fascinating as it was gruesome. This foray into the crazy world of zombifying parasites has been a particularly interesting one for me, and I think there are still enough bizarre, behavior-altering parasites that I will probably do another lecture sometime in the future on this topic. If you found this interesting, make sure that you subscribe so that you can catch all the following lectures. And if you are curious about neuroparasites and you want to find out more about them, I've actually posted some references for that in the comment section below. Are there any questions? Is the zombie website just for honeybees? I don't think so, but um, you can go there and check it out. It's an interesting project. They essentially want people to report them, capture them if possible. Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, that's our lecture, and well, I will possibly catch you next time or uh, on our office hours on Friday. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody, and be careful out there. Don't fall under the mind control. <laughs>